So welcome everybody. Um, for anybody I haven't met yet, my name is Mark Romani and I'm head of European Operations and Publications at the Paide Institute. And as such, I have the honor to introduce our speaker today. Um, Andrew Dinan is currently Associate Professor of Classics and Early Christian Literature at Ave Maria University where he's taught since 2004. He has a graduate degree in theology and a PhD in Greek and Latin from the Catholic University of America. His publications um, range from the field of patristics to that of liturgical Latin and Neo-Latin studies and have appeared in a number of international journals. His particular research interest is the role of Latin within American history and culture. And today we're gonna see a great example of that because uh, Andrew and I will have the privilege to uh, introduce you guys to this uh, new book, uh, Americana Latina, that uh, Andrew has published with us uh, recently, Latin Moments in the History of the United States, Americana Latina is a collection, the first of its kind really, a collection of over 100 Latin texts written for the most part in or about lands that would become or currently are part of the United States. And each text in Americana Latina is accompanied by an English introduction as well as some notes by Andrew on historical and linguistic details. So without further ado, uh, I'll leave the floor to you, Andrew, uh, to explore the uh, wonders of Americana Latina. Over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us this afternoon or morning or evening or whatever time of day it is for you. To those of you in an academic setting, school, college, seminary, university, I hope your exams are all given and moreover graded, and I offer my thanks to you for spending an hour of your wind down period, as it were, with, with us. And to those of you in a non-academic setting, I offer my thanks for taking time on a weekend in the midst of your respite from work to join us. And I wanna thank Marco and Claire and Jason and the leadership and staff of the Paide Institute for my gratitude for providing this form as well as for your encouragement and guidance over recent months as I brought this book to completion and I'm grateful to John as well for his generous encouragement. For the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes or so I'm going to speak about my upcoming book Americana Latini but I hope in a broader sense to address the larger reality of what might be called American Latin because my book after all is only one foray into this vast mostly undiscovered field so let me begin by sketching a little bit of my motivation for the work. Um, as Marco said, I teach at a young, relatively small Catholic university in Southwest Florida. And perhaps, um, as is the case with many of you, uh, if you're teachers, then most of my professional work is devoted to teaching beginning Latin classes to a pretty wide range of students. And I would say at the outset that Americana Latina has emerged for my attempt to make Latin relevant, I know we hear that word a lot, relevant to students, colleagues, and others. Uh, in the summer of 2013, a colleague and I took students to Rome as part of an eight credit course. And our goal was to read Latin in situ. So in advance of this trip, we spent many happy months producing a course reader in which Latin texts, classical, biblical, patristic, and medieval, were matched to our, our itinerary. So for example, in conjunction with our arrival in Rome, we included a, a little bit from Virgil's first eclogue or a passage from Aeneid 7 was prepared with uh, an excursion along the Tiber. Uh, we read Pope St. Damasus's uh, hexameters on St. Agnes as we visited her basilica on the Via Nomentana or his hexameters on St. Cenarius and Achilleus while standing in the underground basilica in the catacomb of Domitila on the Via Ardiatina. And we visited Ostia and read from St. Augustine's Confessions and so forth. 
Now for Latin students, this in C2 reading, it seems to me, is a marvelous compliment and even an enticement to visit Rome or numerous other places throughout Europe and to some extent Asia and Africa. As suggested, if one goes beyond the classical period to include Latin of the patristic era or the medieval era or the Renaissance, then the possibilities for this sort of reading proliferate. Now, all of these experiences, I think, are very exciting for American students of Latin because American students can sense, usually for the first time, a direct connection with the language that they have been studying and with peoples who spoke or read that language. But my question was, could such a thing like that ever happen within the United States? And I should say that my work on Americana Latina began about two or three days after I returned from this 2013 trip to Rome. Now, just to situate this book within maybe broader currents of classics, most people are well aware of what might be called the classical influences upon American culture. All sorts of studies in recent decades have enabled us to know, for example, about the classical reading habits of colonial statesmen and how these readings affected their thinking about government, for example, or slavery in particular. Uh, we know quite a bit about the classical influences upon the arts and literature in America. We know about the role of Latin and Greek in American classrooms. And we also know about the emergence of classics as an academic discipline. We have all sorts of biographies of American classicists. But my focus has been to explore not so much the role of Latin within the American classroom or the rise of classics as a discipline or the influence of a particular classical author, but my goal has been to investigate and to exhibit the role of the Latin language as a means of communication of real communication within the United States. Who was writing or speaking Latin in America? To whom? When? Where? How? And especially why? So this topic is related to these other issues uh, within the discipline of classics, but it's still distinct because after all, not all speakers and writers of Latin have been academics, much less classicists. And again, not all academics and not all classicists have been speakers or writers of Latin. So my hope is that Americana Latina reveals a dimension to the classical tradition within the United States that has not been much studied. And I, I should clarify here, by the way, that I myself am not a fluent speaker of Latin. Uh, occasionally I have written Latin letters and I've made sporadic attempts to keep a Latin diary uh, at times, I attempt to incorporate a modicum of spoken Latin within my classroom, but I I'm not a fluent communicator, as I know several of you are. Now, what I've done is not altogether brand new. Some of you may be aware of the work of Leo M. Kaiser, a longtime classicist at Loyola University in Chicago, um, who, among other publications, compiled an anthology called Early American Latin Verse. Uh, and you may know some of the recent work in the field of Neo-Latin that treats this theme, particularly the expositions and surveys by Ann Blair and Brill's Encyclopedia of the Neo-Latin World by John Gallucci and the Oxford Handbook of Neo-Latin by Stuart McManus and Humanistica Livoniensia. So what, you might ask, is the contribution of my book of Americana Latina? Well, a couple things, and I'm just going to itemize a few of them for you first. I wanted to carry the story further than is typically done. Um, Kaiser's focus, for example, ends at 1800 for prose and a few decades later for poetry, but Latin continued to be used as a language of communication in the United States throughout the 1800s and well into the 1900s. So my book does present several selections from the colonial era, but most of my selections date from later eras. Second, distinction about my book is that I wanted to link as many selections as possible to an historical event, or as I say in the title to my book, a moment in the history of the United States. I was conscious when possible of attempting to demonstrate, again, the relevance of Latin for United States history. 
not just literary history. Third, I wanted to feature a diversity of texts. Previous surveys understandably have well documented the use of Latin in New England, and to some extent the Mid-Atlantic, Pennsylvania, and the Upper South, Virginia. But what about other areas? What about the Latin that was being spoken or written in New Spain, if I may use that term, or New Sweden, New Amsterdam, and of course, New France. So initially, uh, my goal was in fact to find a Latin text for each of the 50 United States. I didn't quite succeed. I did have a Latin text for Utah, and I had one for Nevada, but I didn't include them in my book. Um, the Latin of North Dakota eluded me, but I think I know where to find some. I do have some Latin from Hawaii and Alaska and a good number of the continental states, and only a small portion of my selections come from New England. And the fourth distinctive feature of my book is that I wanted to feature a diversity of genres. Americana Latini does have some poetry, but I deliberately wanted to go beyond what may be called belle lettre, beyond academic exercises as well. I wanted to explore what, what may be called the everyday use of Latin. Latin that was spoken or written with the expectation not so much that people would be impressed that something had been expressed in Latin, but that they would be informed, delighted, or persuaded by what was written in Latin. So what specifically might this mean, these other genres? Well, it, it might mean a table menu written in Latin for a banquet or a Latin monograph. And these were written and published in the United States, especially in the late 1800s. It might mean a personal or even a community or a house diary written in Latin or a speech given in Latin. And I'm not just talking about an academic setting such as Harvard's famous Latin commencement address, but I'm talking about other contexts as well. It might mean a Latin newspaper minutes taken in Latin at a meeting. It might mean a formal report in Latin submitted to a superior, a Latin inscription. And it especially means letters, all sorts of letters written in Latin, professional letters, official letters, formal letters, but also personal letters, letters to one's friends, and even, really surprising to me, letters to one's own family members. One of the delights of researching this book was to discover how many people within the United States have exchanged Latin letters. So this is what I mean by showcasing another side to the classical tradition within the United States, because the persons writing these Latin letters sometimes were well-known public figures. So for example, I include some letters written within the Thoreau family, including his mother, sisters, and himself. But often these letters come from non-classicists and from not so well persons, at least today. Now my goal, once I located these Latin compositions, was to present them, to introduce them, to contextualize them to some extent. So I wanted not only to provide the Latin text, or at least an excerpt of it, but I also wanted to tell a story about the text. So in short, I set out to find Latin passages composed by or intended for, or at least concerning, persons living within the United States or events that took place here, to introduce these texts, to present them, to identify their sources, and perhaps to prompt others to pursue these lines of inquiry and to give some annotation. And so my book consists of 116 selections, or sections, I should say, some of which have more than one selection in it. So altogether, there are perhaps 150 Latin passages in this book, and many more Latin passages are referred to in passing. So let me say a few words about where and how I found these texts, because I, I want to say that searching and locating these texts proved to be enormously satisfying. I can't even tell you how enjoyable this research was. So where did I look? 
Well, in some instances, I was able to visit archives personally and to examine these Latin documents. Other documents were generously shared with me by dedicated archivists and librarians in the United States and overseas who sent me photographs, uh, photocopies or digital images, sometimes for a fee, sometimes for free. And still other documents are accessible online, happily digitized, Google Books, archive.org, Hathi Trust, or elsewhere. Now let me say a little bit more about this elsewhere. Where, in particular, you might wonder. Well, the Library of Congress is a magnificent source for Latin documents, and you do not have to journey to Washington, D.C. to view these. So the papers of the United States presidents, for example, contain many Latin letters, not only from Thomas Jefferson, whose classical learning is fairly well known, but from others. For example, a Lutheran minister in Georgia John Bergman decided to greet the visiting George Washington with a Latin letter upon the occasion of the latter's southern tour in the late spring of 1791. And you can view images of this letter among the George Washington papers on the Library of Congress website. It's not clear to me that Washington was able to comprehend this. From my reading, I know that Washington supported the classical education, but he himself uh, I think was unlikely to have been able to understand this letter, but it's in his papers. Similarly, a Dutch reformed minister sent President Martin Van Buren a Latin letter in the aftermath of the latter's visit to central New York. Van Buren was taking what might be called a politician's vacation in the summer of 1839. And this too, along with many other such letters to the presidents can be viewed on the Library of Congress website. Uh, newspaper archives are another wonderfully promising source. Those of you who have done genealogical research, you know well of the astonishing ease of having the pages of a small town newspaper from one or even two centuries ago appear on your computer screen with only a few keystrokes and a click. It's incredible. Some of these newspaper archives require subscriptions, but others do not. The Library of Congress, for example, sponsors Chronically in America, a free online site that contains newspaper pages from 1789 through 1963. And individual state and university libraries also provide access to digitized newspapers. This is how I discovered, for example, several Latin poems by a former Jesuit seminarian named Almaricus Zapponi, who was born in 1822. The Italian-born Zapponi had come to Washington, D.C. to undertake seminary studies at Georgetown, but after a brief time, he left the seminary, crossed the Potomac, married, and settled in Alexandria, Virginia, where he taught languages and music. Later, he would become a medical doctor and practice in Washington, but Zapponi clearly retained much from his classical education for, among other poems, he published an ode to a chaplain in the Mexican-American War, an elegy for the wife of the Cuban ambassador, and a lengthy 73 stanzas of Alsaics, Carmen Panegyticum for General and President Zachary Taylor. At least three of his Latin poems were printed in Washington area newspapers, including the Alexandria Gazette. Now, sometimes these newspaper searches can be tantalizing and frustrating. Let me share with you one such frustration. Perhaps you can help me, or perhaps you can succeed where I have not. Many of you are familiar with Francis Glass, he, um, uh, who composed the Vita of George Washington in Latin. More on this a little later. But in researching Glass, I found a reference to a Latin poem he had written on the death of Lord Byron, which is said to have been published in a July 1824 edition of the Dayton Watchman. But my repeated efforts to locate this have not been successful. Really, I suppose uh, our surprise should be that any ephemera or ephemerides from this era have survived at all. But there are other instances, that is, a record of someone having written something in Latin, which I've not been able to locate. 
So you see the problem that we face in the ancient world when we work on ancient texts of possessing only a portion of an author's larger corpus is also an issue with Latin of very recent eras as well, surprising as that may be. Another great source for United States Latin are periodicals. On the one hand, these periodicals may be field specific, such as classical journal, classical weekly, classical bulletin. So for example, one can find a Latin ode written by Professor John Rolfe of the University of Pennsylvania, who's known today perhaps for his many Loeb translations. But Rolfe composed an ode for a meeting of the Classical Club of Philadelphia. This meeting took place shortly after the United States had entered the era of prohibition, which Rolfe laments in his ode. But other periodicals with Latin compositions are not field specific. So for example, I found some Latin in the Phi Beta Kappa Chi or in the Cosmos Club Bulletin. The Phi Beta Kappa Chi contains a Latin ode composed by Margaret Coleman Waits, who did not live long, 1883 to 1923. And she wrote this in 1921 to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the inauguration of Mary E. Woolley at Mount Holyoke. Waits lived, she only lived two years beyond this event. She died of pneumonia in March of 1923, just two days before she was to be elected full professor. The Cosmos Club Bulletin contains a Latin translation of the Gettysburg Address. This is something that perhaps some of you have translated yourselves. It seems to be a, a staple of the conclusion of Latin prose composition courses, at least in the United States. Well, the, this particular selection that I found was composed for the 1959 celebration of the sequicentennial of Abraham Lincoln's birth. It was the work of a New York priest, Monsignor Edwin Ryan, and an engrossed and framed copy of this Latin version was presented to the apostolic delegate in a formal reception in Washington in June of 1959, and the Latin text, in fact, was entered into the congressional record. So these sort of things can be found in periodicals, not just as I say, uh, classics periodicals, but even uh, others as well. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, new academic journals, especially in the field of history, particularly religious history, printed all sorts of American Latin letters and documents that were being discovered in archives around the world. An early volume of the Catholic Historical Review, for example, prints the Latin text of a 1789 letter signed by nine Native Americans. They were members of the Oneida tribe in central New York, and this letter was written to the Pope. They were requesting a bishop. Here I should mention an especially valuable archive. It's the Archivio Storico de Propaganda Fide in Rome. In the early 1800s, many Catholic seminarians from the United States and elsewhere studied in Rome at the Urbaniana. These students had to undertake a pledge obligating them and their alia to write regularly from their far-flung mission fields with updates on their labors. These letters, many of which were in Latin, are found in this archive. What is especially attractive is that not only can one see the classical idiom applied to various aspects of modernity, such as the railroad, for example, but one also sees in these letters Latin pertaining to areas far beyond New York and other population centers of the Eastern Seaboard. University journals and alumni bulletins are fruitful sources for American Latin. Georgetown's college bulletin, for instance, from the late 1800s and early 1900s, contains several Latin poems, and at least one in Greek, I should add. Uh, one of these Latin poems included in my book was an ode to winter written by a Jesuit priest who happened to be a leader in the field of seismology. He has the distinction of being the first American seismographer to alert the press about the calamitous Tokyo earthquake of 1923. But clearly, this Jesuit retained his facility with Latin verse composition. Similarly, there is an ode to tobacco that is found in the University of Toronto Monthly, written by Robert Bonner, who later was a professor at the University of Chicago specializing in Greek law. But at the time he was in the faculty of Stetson University in Florida. Uh, 
not all these compositions, I should clarify, are marked by what we might call gravitas. Uh, the 1929 volume of the Georgetown College Journal presents a long hexameter poem on a football game between NYU and Georgetown. Similarly, the Harvard Alumni Bulletin offers an obituary for an annual game of football that having become too rough and presumably working at cross purposes with the academic culture of Harvard was banned by a vote of the faculty in the summer of 1860. State historical societies and university libraries are also a good source for Latin documents. In one case, I came across a reference to a younger sister who went on to become a psychologist, exchanging Latin letters with her older brother, who was away at school at Iowa College, now Grinnell, in 1890. These are very brief letters, and they include mistakes. A librarian at the University of Michigan graciously sent me photocopies of this modest corpus, but it's a delight to see the original handwriting, see the postmark, see ordinary family matters, such as an older brother's need for the laundry to be done while he's away at college, expressed in the Latin language. Far from being a forbidden, a forbidding entity, Latin here is, I would say, a language of intimacy. This is not an isolated situation. I found examples of this sort of familial Latin in papers from the Tennessee Historical Society and from the Missouri Historical Society. The former contains an astonishing Latin letter written from a father in what would later be Tennessee, addressed to a family member back home in Maryland. And uh, the Missouri Historical Society contains Latin letters written by another father a Protestant minister, one of the so-called Latin farmers of Missouri, written from the Missouri State House where he was serving as representative to his young son back home during the Civil War. Politics are only lightly apparent in these letters, which speak rather of family matters. And finally, religious communities, largely Catholic, especially the Jesuits, are an enormously productive place to look for Latin compositions. As you no doubt know, the Jesuits, since their founding, have been champions of Latin, and their schools sought to cultivate eloquentia perfecta by means of the close study and imitation of classical models. So Jesuit archives, not only in the United States, St. Louis and Georgetown in particular, but also worldwide, contain an immense amount of American Latin. Not only poems, but official reports, letters, inscriptions, diaries. In his book, Latin Story of a World Language, the Tübingen professor, Jürgen Lienhardt, says, quote, the core of any ongoing tradition of Latin must involve a group of people, whether small or large as unimportant, who have internalized Latin as a, quote, unquote, normal language. And I hope that I demonstrated in my book that such a group, and it was quite large, was the Jesuits. To give one example, in my book, I include an excerpt from the notes that one Jesuit had compiled for a course he was giving on Latin epigraphy in 1880 at Woodstock College, located a bit west of Baltimore. Now, what I find remarkable about these notes is not only that such a course was thought to be beneficial in 1880 in the United States, but that the course notes themselves were in Latin. The 20 plus pages of these notes may be found in the archives of the Maryland province of the Society of Jesus. So you can safely say that wherever the Jesuits were, there was Latin and the Jesuits went throughout the United States. Now I should clarify that my searches are only initial forays. They've not been altogether systematic and they're by no means thorough. I wanna underscore what I have assembled is only a portion, a very small portion but hopefully a suggestive portion of what will be found, not what might be, but will be found by those who go looking. At times I've been led to these documents by footnotes and other scholarly work. This is how, for example, I came to a brief Latin poem written in 1814 by the early Virginia legal scholar, St. George Tucker, which he included in a private letter to William Wirt, one time presidential candidate. I think it was a reference in another scholarly work that alerted me to an amazing 46-page Latin 
letter written by a Catholic priest from Belgium who was ministering to African Americans in the American South and West and Native Americans. This 1903 document was bound in red and stamped confidentiale and it was entitled, and I'm translating here, Concerning the Wretched Condition of Black Catholics in America. What a surprise to discover that it had been digitized. And at my desk in Florida, I could read this graphic account written in, quote, language of white hot passion, to quote one historian, by this Belgian priest residing in Oklahoma, it was not yet a state, addressed to ecclesiastical officials in Rome. So I hope it's clear from this last example that some of the American compositions, American Latin compositions that I've assembled treat issues of profound importance for American history and culture, often with great pathos. I've included one letter that discusses the sale of slaves and another that discusses the predicament of a Catholic missionary priest caught in the middle as the United States government sought to purchase Native American lands in Idaho. So before I conclude, let me share with you just a bit more about five particular documents that I've included so you can get some sense of what's there. Number one, did you know that Europeans were in Virginia? In fact, almost in the very spot of Jamestown, where Jamestown would be later, more than three decades prior to the arrival of the English in 1607. In September of 1570, eight Spanish Jesuits attempted to found a mission in the Chesapeake Bay region along the York River. It did not last long. After about five months, in early February 1571, they were all killed. Only a young altar server survived. Now, most of the early sources for this relatively unknown incident are in Spanish, but a few are in Latin, including one that has been overlooked in historiography. This is one of the Jesuit Litere Anue, the annual letters they sent back to Rome from their distant mission fields. This particular Litere Anue was written in Mexico. The original's lost, but we have excerpts made elsewhere. Now, two points emerge from this example. First, what I might call the transnational or transatlantic quality of Latin. Now, many of us are familiar with this transnational phenomenon of Latin within Europe, but it's quite another matter, I think, to see it manifest in this hemisphere. Here again, we have an example of a, a Latin a letter originally written in Mexico about events that took place in Virginia, meant to be read in Rome this marvelous triangle, if you will. The second point that emerges from this letter is the importance of Latin for the study of American history. Because as I said, this is a primary source. Again, Latin should be of use for European historians as axiomatic, but that it might be useful for American historians is perhaps not so. The second document I might mention is uh, from Francis Glass the enigmatic Latin scholar I mentioned earlier, who wrote the Vita of George Washington. Enigmatic, because very little is known about him. But on the Library of Congress website, among the James Madison papers, are images of a Latin letter that Glass wrote to then ex-president Madison that offers new information about Glass's life, his upbringing, his financial condition, his frustrated aspirations for a military commission, and details about the composition of the Vita, specifically the fact that Glass intended to dedicate this Vita to Madison. One purpose of his Latin letter was to ask Madison's permission to make this dedication. Madison, for his part, wrote back in English and with exquisite tact declined this honor. The third example is um, a little over a decade ago, Loris College Press in Dubuque, Iowa, published two volumes containing respectively the outgoing and incoming correspondence of Matthias Loris, a French-born priest who became the first bishop of Dubuque. Loris was not a skilled Latinist, but as was typical in his day, he had to use it. 
from time to time. Among his incoming letters are several from German-speaking priests who were in or were seeking to come to the United States. Incidentally, this shows what should not be a surprise, that at times Latin was the only common language between various immigrant groups within the United States. Now, the most elegant of the Latin letters found in Loris's papers is a letter of apology from an Austrian-born priest, Joseph Saltzman, who's considered the founder of St. Francis de Sales Seminary in Milwaukee. Saltzman was a talented fundraiser. But on one occasion, in the fall of 1856, his zeal outstripped his prudence. He crossed the Mississippi River from Wisconsin into Iowa, which took him into Loris's diocese, and he took up a collection at a parish in the town of New Vienna. The problem was that he had neglected to ask Loris's permission ahead of time. He thus found himself in the unenviable position of having to tender a letter of apology as he hastily made his exit back across the Mississippi into Wisconsin. Now, what I found remarkable was that Saltzman chose to write this letter of apology in Latin, and it's quite sophisticated. In fact, the letter takes the form of the sacrament of penance, with Saltzman stating his misdeed with the attendant circumstances, expressing his condition, his, sorry, his contrition, and his firm purpose of amendment, and even volunteering to take on certain penances or restitution. He quotes scripture and classical poetry. Among other interesting details, he refers to the Mississippi as a superfluvium. Couldn't find precedent for that in Latin. And he pleads that the Mississippi should not be seen as the Rubicon. Now, I obtained images of this letter through the kindness of the archivist of the Archdiocese of Dubuque, and it was a delight to read. In my book, I relate it to an argument made by a long-standing professor of classics at the University of Wisconsin, who sought to demonstrate that Americans on the frontier were not uncultured. So what I've tried to do in the book is to say, not only tell a story about these, but also relate these letters um, to currents within classics and currents within American history. I should add that for all its eloquence, Saltzman's letter was unsuccessful. Uh, Loris was adamant that none of the parishioners who had pledged money to Saltzman was bound to honor this commitment. And moreover, he, he was prepared to contact Saltzman's bishop if Saltzman ever again interfered in Loris's diocese. The fourth example is that, um, um, well, pertains to a, a phenomenon in recent years. Recent years have seen increased attention to African-American classicists and the influence of the classics on African-American authors. And a great desideratum related to my investigation is the location of original Latin compositions by African-Americans. And my book, Americana Latina, includes one poem that was written by James Quagir Agri, who was a native of present-day Ghana. He died in 1927, who matriculated at Livingston College in Salisbury, North Carolina. Agri gave the third Latin salutatory address and the first Greek oration in the history of Livingston. And he is said to have been the first to write uh, first Livingston student to write a Latin poem. Following graduation, he did coursework at Columbia, earning an MA and coming close to a PhD before his death. Now, Agri sustained an, an interest in, in the classics throughout his life. He studied Latin and Greek with his wife. He is reported to have read Horace's odes and epistles to his child in utero. While at Columbia's summer school in 1914, he wrote a Latin valedictory ode entitled Bene Valete, which so impressed his sociology professor that Agri was asked to read it aloud on the last day of class. By the way, this was another one of my frustrations. This poem was printed in an August issue of the Columbia Student, a recent offshoot, a newspaper that was an offshoot in the summer of 1914, from what I can gather of the Daily Spectator. 
but although the issues of the Daily Spectator are generously available online, I've not yet been able to locate this issue of the Columbia student. Someone perhaps will locate it someday. Let me add that the archives of many HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, I think are promising sources for Latin compositions by African Americans. These should definitely be explored. Um, I've only been able to do it to some extent uh, online. But in my book, I demonstrate the robust classical curriculum of HBCUs such as Howard and Lincoln University in particular, and the Latin orations that were regularly delivered at the latter, for example, by uh, individuals who went on to become quite prominent in their fields. And the fifth and final example I'll mention is a Latin sapphic poem that was a prize winning entry in a competition for the Horus Biomillennium that took place in 1935. Classicists were somewhat hesitant about this commemoration, especially since it came not many years after the successful Virgil Biomillennium. As part of the competition, undergraduates in the United States and Canada were invited to submit entries for an essay and ode contest which entailed a metrical translation from one of Horace's odes or opodes, a 5,000 word essay, and the compilation of original Latin ode or satire, 20 to 30 lines in length. A panel of three judges, one each from Amherst College, the Catholic University of America, and the University of Kansas, voted to award the prize, unanimously voted, to Jean Holtzworth, a senior at Bryn Mawr. Holtzworth used her prize money to spend a year at the American Academy in Rome. She went on to earn an MA and a PhD in Latin from Bryn Mawr, and she took a position at Mount Holyoke. But in 1943, according to her obituary, it was after the death of a beloved cat. She left the field of classics, enrolled in veterinary school at Cornell, and she went on to become a specialist in feline diseases. In the text of her winning ode, which adverts, so far as I can tell, though it does not mention names, to Mussolini and his intentions in Ethiopia, was published in an issue of the Bryn Mawr Alumni Magazine. I should add that for these later selections, I had to secure permission in order to comply with copyright law. And in this case, it took me many months um, of getting up my courage, well, first of searching, but then getting up my courage to write an email to the eminent patristic scholar Peter Brown, whom I knew well from, uh, uh, I knew well of, uh, from my patristic studies, because I learned that he is married to Jean Holtzworth's niece, Dr. Elizabeth Gillian Brown. And when I contacted her, Dr. Brown could not have been more gracious in her reply to me and allowing me to print this poem. So I hope you have some sense, not only of what's in America Latina, Americana Latina, but also um, some of the adventures and the happiness I had in searching for these. So I think I've said enough to give you an idea of the book, but it said at the outset, uh, more than the book, the vast field of Neo-Latin in America. The question may arise whether these selections could be used in the classroom and when I first got serious about this book, I was thinking of designing it for that purpose. But in the end, I decided not to go that route. Of course, I hope that Latinists at all levels will find something of interest here. The range of Latin is wide, from children's Latin to the Latin of prominent humanists. But my annotations on these texts do not pertain to syntax. Rather, they largely explicate historical and religious elements. Now, one final word, my focus has been on the United States, or I should say lands that would eventually comprise the United States, although I have included a few selections that pertain to Mexico and Canada. Because as I said, Latin in this hemisphere was very much a transnational phenomenon. But I think uh, the Latin of New Spain in Mexico, for example, has been um, much more studied than that of the United States. Eventually, someone will write some sort of major study of Latin within the United States. But for now, we are still at the stage of identifying and collecting the work of analysis and synthesis 
will come eventually. So that's it. Those are my remarks. I thank you for your patience. I know I went longer than these book talks usually do, but um, I hope that that uh, I hope, hope you stayed awake. Um, I'm sorry. I only say that because I have a joke in my family that when I produce a writing, I usually read it to my family the night before the conference, and it's um, fantastic bed, bedtime reading because um, everybody ends up asleep at the end of it. Um, hopefully. That didn't happen here. Anyways, I do welcome your your discussion or, or conversation or questions. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, this was great. Let's do a round of virtual applause. Um, so I'd like to uh, open the floor for discussion in a moment. But before I do that, uh, let me just remind everyone that the book uh, Americana Latina is available for pre-order through the Paideia Institute online store. So I'm gonna put the link uh, in the Zoom chat so you can, uh, you can all see it and follow it. Um, the book is now available for pre-order, which means uh, it will, if you pre-order it now, it will be shipped to you sometime in January, so early in the new year. Um, and without further ado, let me ask uh, if anybody has any questions. Uh, now, there should be a, a button called reactions at the bottom of your screen. So perhaps you can uh, use that to sort of virtually raise your hand uh, if you have a question. I'm sure there's going to be lots of, uh, lots of questions from the audience since uh, there's so much of great interest uh, in what we're talking about. So John, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't see a hand raising thing. So I just see the, you know, that little uh, thumbs up. That thing works. That looks, yeah. Um, so I so wanted to ask, and Andrew, um, so do you have uh, actual experience of pet, you know, you, you said that uh, your initial interest in this was pedagogical. So uh, do you have experiences of using these texts in the classroom? And do you have any where you like, oh, and this, this worked or this didn't work? Uh, and that, that's something I'd, I'd love to see just kind of like a, as a long-term thing because, uh, you know, the, the pedagogical problem you bring up of making Latin re relevant is kind of a perennial one. And so it's one which, uh, which many teachers will be, picking up this book, thinking, you know, what actually will work in the classroom and what, what can I, I bring there, you know, uh, next Tuesday? Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I have only a limited experience with that in the classroom. A few years back, I had a course in Latin prose composition and I compiled some, some samples um, that I had at the time and brought them into class. And I tried to, at the time, come up with, uh, as I said, I tried to come up with Latin for each of the 50 states. And so I tried to intrigue students by giving them Latin that was written about the states where I knew they were from. Um, so that's, I think that's my only experience having done that in the classroom. Originally, um, we, we now use Latin for the new millennium in the classes here at Ave Maria, in, in my classes. I, at the time, I used Orberg's uh, Lingua Latina which I very much like. And uh, I had designed this to be one of those second year readers. That is, I was glossing all of the Latin words that don't show up in the first lingua Latina uh, in the margins. I was glossing them in Latin. And so I still have, you know, in earlier drafts of this, um, a, a lot of that material. But as I say, I, um, and, and actually initially the introduction to the book was in Latin. But no, I broke from that uh, for various reasons. Um, and so it's not, how would I put it, it's not, um, it's not directly um, able to be used in the classroom. Um, but I hope indirectly it is, and I do think there's a lot of potential. Um, I mean, I, I guess my perspective is, and I know we all face this issue, um, how to, it's interesting, when you read this Latin, you realize that they themselves had been schooled in the classics and uh, cite the classics. And so I, I believe strongly that it's important to give pride of place to classical authors in the classroom. Um, and even as, as you suggest, it, it, it seems like um, it could be pedagogically beneficial to find a way to incorporate, at least in the United States, 
some of these selections and some of the upper years or, or even from time to time in the, in the younger years. So a long way of saying um, very little, um, but, but there's lots to be done. Yeah, well, that sounds like a, a future book project too. You hear that, Marco? Indeed. Yeah, actually, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, Andrew, since um, uh, there's something you mentioned about the uh, rise in interest in um, the Native Americans' engagement with Latin. And you say uh, there's actually an amazing uh, poem written by a Native American student in Latin uh, as part of the, uh, the anthology. So that's uh, number 24, I believe, in the book. Yes, and you say in the introduction to that poem, you say that um, uh, there's a lot still to be uh, discovered. Uh, a lot remains to be explored in the uh, Native, Native American engagement with Latin. And this is uh, something I found particularly interesting because I actually happened to be at Harvard when uh, two graduate students there discovered this uh, previously unpublished poem by Benjamin Larnell, a student at what was uh, at the time called the Harvard Indian College. And I still remember, uh, you know, many years later, I still remember the great excitement uh, on campus about this, uh, this new discovery. So it seems like a lot remains to be uh, unearthed yet. So um, could you um, give a piece of advice to anybody in our audience or perhaps on our YouTube channel who was interested in doing some further research on this topic, where, where would you look for these things? Yes. Well, I had another frustrating experience with the uh, newspaper search in that regard. I came upon a reference to a Latin poem that was um, delivered at a wedding. In, if I'm not mistaken, the wedding was in Tennessee, yes, in, in Mount Eagle, Tennessee. And the poem was by a woman, uh, a Cherokee woman, and I um, was unable to locate this, this text, it, it, if it still exists. Um, I, I made one inquiry, uh, it didn't pan out. But this is, the, this is the sort of thing that I know is out there. Um, but as far as where exactly to look, well, um, one place would be archives of Native American tribes. Another place, and often in conjunction with that, would be archives of schools that were um, on um, Native American, and, and that were, were Native Americans attended. Um, you, you mentioned the Harvard Indian School, but there were, there were other schools as well, um, especially in the, the 1800s, that had a, a classical curriculum. And so that's been kind of my guide. I assume that, well, if, if you have a curriculum in which students are studying Latin and, and possibly Greek for many, many years, and as we know in that era, less so today, but that era, a course um, in Latin involved composition in Latin. That was something that, that was entirely proper and the norm. Um, so people were making all sorts of Latin compositions as part of their, their school. Well, they didn't cease to do that the moment they walked out of school upon graduation day. So some of them, for various reasons, retained that, not only the ability, but the interest later in life. So, um, as I say, a starting point would be the archives of these schools that sponsored a classical curriculum. Um, but not only there, I think that they, they exist elsewhere too. Um, and to say, you, you know, you get a, an occasional glimpse as I did with that uh, item from the newspaper. Um, so I know there are others out there. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, we're rapidly running out of time, but perhaps we, have, we still have time for a couple more questions. Everyone? Well, um, oh, Diana, please go ahead. <laughs> 
Andrew, thank you. Um, I just to follow up on John's question. Um, I'm really excited about getting the book and reading um, the glass letter to Washington. And it got me thinking just about um, besides, I, I imagine there'll be a telepaideia course down the road on, on Native American Latin, but um, just how interesting this, this work can be for those of us who work in high schools and have students studying concurrently with Latin American history. And I'm just wondering, would it be easy for someone like me or a high school student to detect, say, um, echoes of, say, a classical author writing to a general? Um, in the letter of glass to Washington, or you know, would that be possible? Or um, can you see ways of making connections between uh, colonial Latin and ancient Latin for a high school audience? I think definitely. And so um, I didn't I'm trying to think. I didn't include any examples in my book, but I refer to some, um, for example, and I'm. I'm have in mind the some of the Latin within the Winthrop family um, of New England. The you, you see the continuity between the education in Europe and the education in New England, um, especially in terms of composition of Latin letters. So there would be uh, models that that would be copied by students in school. And these models would be um, from uh, the humanists and also from the classical period. So I think that very much went on and those connections very much can be made. Um, I will say along those lines, uh, the, the, the letter I went into some detail about the letter of apology and please, I, I very much welcome if, if um, anybody can help me with this, but I was struggling to find um, much precedent in the classical period for a letter of apology. <laughs> I actually have, have found two such ones from the United States, um, but this, this seems to have not been, um, not been much done, or at least hasn't survived. Uh, but anyways, answer your question. Yes, I think that that possibility certainly exists. And Diana, also thanks for the great idea. In fact, I, I, I almost want to teach a Telepaidea course on this stuff myself. <laughs> um, okay, uh, any further questions for Andrew? Yes, Heather, please go ahead. Hi, mine's not really a question because you answered it. I'm in Oklahoma and I was curious if you had any letters from Oklahoma, which I really look forward to your book. And the minute I saw this announcement, I was like, I want to do that in my classroom. And I teach middle school, so it was so inspiring. And I thought, and then your comment on the intimacy, I just thought, okay, we're going to start writing. We're going to start writing letters wherever they are, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and and just go from there. So thank you so much for the inspiration. You're welcome. You're welcome. And that, that was really a, it was very revealing to me because I I, I don't know what uh, of course everybody has a different experience, but sometimes there's this sense that Latin is, is um, always solemn and formal and distant. Um, and of course it can be, but what I've tried to do in the book is also show that Latin was uh, a real language of intimacy for many people. That is um, something I'm working on right now is, is I'm, editing and uh, transcribing and, and translating the, the corpus of letters between two Irish American prelates in the 19th century. One was the Archbishop of St. Louis and the other went on to become the Archbishop of Baltimore. And they sustained a three decade long correspondence. And it's almost all in Latin. Now, why is that? I mean, they, they could have written in English, they could have written in other languages. But, but they chose Latin, it was not, um, well, I should just say, on the one hand, they could, on the other hand, um, it was natural to them. But I think it's also possible to see that there is a certain intimacy, a certain um, endearing quality, if I may, um, intimacy, I guess I just leave it at that, about the use of Latin that I think is important for our students to see. I have a section of the book on the rise of Latin drama in the United States, because a few of the selections pertain in, um, to some productions in the, in the late 19th century. And the comment that I saw at the time was, classicists really liked the introduction of 
uh, say Terrence into the curriculum because for the first time, and they like to stage plays, I should say, because oftentimes students sense for this first time that Latin could be a real language of communication, not just something to read on a page, but something to um, engage in conversation with, albeit on the stage in a stylized fashion. But I think that letters afford that even more. In other words, that glimpse of intimacy even more. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited if you can if you can do that, and I think it certainly can be done. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, any remaining questions? Any final thoughts? Okay, if not, uh, we can thank Andrew uh, once more for a wonderful talk. Uh, so a round of virtual applause. Uh, there we go. And um, uh, please don't forget to uh, order your own copy of Americana Latine.